you have to start with a problem, all right? That's definitely where you need to start with innovation. You don't want to innovate for the sake of innovating, but you don't want to start with just any problem. You need to start with the real problem. And I think that's where a good majority of the mistakes happen with innovation is that we're solving the wrong problem sometimes. What's the key element often forgotten by leaders when driving innovation? In this episode of The Creator Community, we meet innovation consultant and author Matt Muller, who shares his key principles for leading and driving change. Broad acceptance of your idea, both internally and externally, is critical to making it happen. Focusing on the root of the true problem rather than pushing your solution is just one of the many key lessons of today's episode and one of the most important things leaders can do to drive true innovation and change. Check out the show. Welcome to the Creator Community. This is a podcast from book publisher, New Degree Press, or NDP, powered by Manuscripts, Inc. I'm your host, John Saunders. This show is designed to celebrate, elevate, and showcase many of the incredible authors that have published their books with NDP. In this show, we learn about the authors, their journeys, and their books. This year, NDP will cross over 1,700 published authors on six continents and earn a spot on the Inc. 5000 list for the second year in a row. This is the fastest growing privately held companies in America. If you have ever thought of writing a book but weren't sure where to start or how to finish, visit manuscripts.com to learn more. This is episode two of season six, and today I have with me Matt Muller. He is the author of The Mindful Innovator, Learn How to Slow Down to Move Faster and More Purposefully, which is due out 2023. A little bit about Matt. From a young age, Matt wondered what separated people who create change from everyone else. With 8 billion people in the world, how can there be so few change makers, he wondered. Obsessed with this question, Matt grew into an energetic innovator focused on helping others create change. He is an innovation consultant working with some of the world's largest brands and is a columnist for Innovation Leader. Matt has long-term experience executing strategy and facilitating change and is passionate about sharing his insights with leaders across the globe, helping them transform company culture to meet their innovation needs more purposefully. Matt also loves spending time on one of the many local Gulf beaches in Florida, reconnecting with what matters most, family. Matt, great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, John. Awesome to be here. The pleasure is all mine. You know, before we get into your fascinating book, it's always interesting, I think, for our listeners to learn a little bit about your journey and what led you to here with your career and, and the work you've done. It has been a pretty cool journey. I started off in high school and through college working in retail. And when I got out of college, like retail was going really well, I was making decent money, and it was hard for me to break out into a profession. So I wound up just sticking with it and, and doing a lot of time there. But then you get that burnout, right, in, in retail. Like it's, it's tough, a tough job. And I was trying to find a way out. I found my way through working in a corporation that was very closely linked to retail and worked there a bit. I stumbled on innovation and found my, my place in this department. And it was absolutely amazing. It was inspiring, energetic. I met with some really amazing people, worked with amazing people within the company. I had a chance to work with some awesome authors that were out there and got to see how their books correlate to the work that they do. And it really just inspired me to write my own book. I was like, I am doing these amazing things within innovation. There needs to be a book or another book about innovation with my journey in it. And that's when I started to really go on that author journey. And that's been amazing. It's been about four years. I started writing it four years ago. I'd wake up 4 a.m. in the morning and I just start to write in my office right here in this space and just start typing on the keyboard, writing things down. And I go to my commute to to the office about an hour away and every day at around six, seven o'clock in the morning. And I just do that every single day. But there were a lot of stops and starts. I'd write for two months, stop for a month, start again, and stop again. And I realized that it was just, I was doing like a brain dump. It wasn't really writing a book. I was just journaling. And that's when I learned mind mapping and started putting it all together on the whiteboard and saying, okay, what do I really want to say? And that's when I started to really be able to start writing a book and kind of brought me right here to this moment of getting ready to launch. The accidental mindful innovator is maybe what I'm hearing here, right? You're working <laughs> in retail. As I recall, there was a, from hearing a story a while back, there was a phone call you got at seven in the morning that said, hey, come on up. We'd like to talk to you about joining the innovation team in this retail yeah. organization or the corporate end of the retail organization. And, and off you went. And all the while you were writing and journaling. But there's a difference, Matt, between people that journal and published authors, right? And it's being published. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the one yes. way to uh, get there. 
the <laughs> one way to get there, right, is having that process, having that structure, because it's so easy to get lost in the thing. And mm-hmm. so that's what you did, right? You dove into this coaching program. How did you find it, Matt? And, and you know, maybe talk a little bit more about how you fit it in your life. It sounds like we heard part of that story, but how did you it find was, the program? It was serendipitous. Again, it just, things just find me, I guess. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> but uh, I was getting to a point where I was starting to mind map things and outline the whole book. But what was really a challenge was I was starting to stop and start and stop again in my writing. I was trying to figure out what, why that was. So reflecting back on it, I had this like fear and it was a fear, I guess, of being judged. Like where, will my employer be mad if I write this book? Will people really want to hear what I'm saying? And that was kind of what my hesitation was. And I was just scrolling on LinkedIn and I ran across another NDP author, Michael Mangold, who just wrote a book, Building Networks. Great book. Definitely recommend it, by the way. But I just saw what what he was doing and the process he was going through. And it really just captivated me. So I wound up setting up a call with Eric Coaster just to talk about the program and ask him just, you know, exactly what is NDP all about and how does it work? But I also wanted to, you know, kind of share with him my fears and saying, hey, that this is really what, what, what I'm struggling with. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about, like, you know, what I should do? And he said two things to me that were very profound and changed everything for me. And the first one was, well, Matt, do you have anything that is worth sharing with the world? And absolutely, I do. I have something that's worth sharing with the world. I have a really great experience with innovation and a different take on it than most people have. He said, great. Well, then you need to write your book. And and point two, I think that he made was probably the best. He said, Matt, no one gives a shit you're writing a book. And that was like the most like beautiful way that that term was ever used to me was that no one cared because what it did was it got me out of my own head. It stopped me from judging myself. And got me focused on it. I just need to do this. There's no reason to do it. It's just an excuse. So those were the two things that really got me fired up and really ready to write a book. Do you have a story you want to tell and recognize that nobody really cares? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but as you bring them into the journey, which is part of the process and part of the coaching you go through, they begin to care and help drive you and really get you up on top of that wave and, and push you along in many ways. And hopefully, I think you had a similar experience, an experience that felt a bit like that, no? Yeah, absolutely. It kind of just tells you like you're, you're you're your own worst critic and it's going to support you, right? So it's not that big of a deal. Go go and do it. Don't have a fear because you're afraid of what people aren't going to like what you say. Uh, the, the level of imposter syndrome that I think every single person, including the most famous authors in the world, have mm-hmm. in writing a book is unbelievable. And that's why I think this program, this community-driven program is so, so important because you go through it with a group of people going through the same challenge together, which for me is, I wrote my book in 2020, hard to believe it's been that long already, it made it so much more, I'll say, palatable to go through. And so love that, uh, appreciate you sharing that vulnerability and what it was like. And I think, it, it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but having that process, having that coaching is so helpful in, in overcoming that and getting out of the gate. Is that a fair statement? For your oh, experience. absolutely. Yeah. The the coaching absolutely allows you to kind of get, I guess, get those second opinions on what you're thinking in your mind and gives you a total whole new level of confidence and also gives you your blind spots because guess what? We don't know everything, right? So having that coaching definitely from someone that already has done it. I think one of the things that I've heard a lot during this program was that it's like, it's like you're a second time author, a first time, second time author, right? And that's just, it's so true. We're using the wisdom and the coaching and the guidance to be able to be much smarter about our launch of our first book. Right. That's the idea. Writing your book as if you were, it was the second time you did it. Because of course, like uh, to use the golf analogy, right? The mulligan is always the better one, right? So let's go with the mulligan the first time and, and yeah. get it right. <laughs> and one more thought on the on the imposter syndrome, which I've had so many of these conversations over the last few years working with the authors. And then I would tell you for every one of them, for every award, and now it's nearing a hundred that this program has produced book awards or finalists for book awards, for every one of those awards, there are three people that said, I don't know if I have anything worth it to write about here because they were so riddled with imposter syndrome. And then fast forward three, six months, they start applying to different book awards and lo and behold, they won them. Uh, Absolutely. So, so fun. You know, before we dive into your book, talk about your cover a little bit. You came up with a pretty interesting one. How did that process come together? Uh, That that was a lot of fun. So it's like, Writing a book is creative, yes. So putting words down on paper, absolutely, and, and making sure that it all makes sense and it's something that sticks is a creative process and it's awesome. But doing a cover is a whole nother type of creative. And that was a lot of fun to be able to kind of go between the two of them. And it really was awesome because like when you're designing the cover, you're doing it in between like phases. So it, you're just, just about to start your revisions phase right before you start it. You go in and you work on a mock-up cover with a couple of designers, and that was a lot of fun. I did a 30-minute session with two designers, and we developed three 
three covers, mock-up covers, like in 30 minutes. And it was so cool to be able to kind of see it happen in real time, really that fast to kind of get an idea of which cover do we really want to go with. And then after you're done with revisions, then we go and we fine tune and pick pick one of those out and then we keep on fine tuning it. And that was just a lot of fun. So a lot of designers helped me out with it, people that really know what they're doing. And, and we really went down with a cover that I think symbolizes both innovation and mindfulness, right? We took the the meditator to represent mindfulness and a light bulb to represent innovation. And we melded them together to create a, I think, a cover that really pops and symbolizes what this book is all about. So I'm absolutely in love with the cover. I, I think it's a work of art, but I guess it's my baby. So... <laughs> You're yeah. going to feel that way about you, baby. I, I love the, uh, again, sharing the stages that you went through. Just like the book, no one shows up and says, here's my 200, 250 pages, right? Cover the same idea. You have a concept, innovation, light bulb, meditator. Like, how do we make this thing come together? What kind of feedback did you get from your audience on it? The audience, uh, man, it, that was the toughest part, getting the feedback from them because they all had a favor, right? They all had a horse in the in the, in the in the race and they want to want to win. But the feedback from that was so helpful just to understand what was resonating with them, right? It's like, because great, you love the cover, but why do you love it? And they were able to give me that little feedback of, oh, the splash of color really draw, drew my eyes to the, the light bulb. Perfect. So whether I went with cover A or cover C, I knew that I needed to create a splash of, of color that was going to draw their attention to something. So those little insights from the audience was absolutely a game changer for me. And I, I was so glad that I was able to do it just with that group because doing it alone is, is it would definitely be too tough. That's fantastic. And this is part of the journey as well, getting your content out to people early to get some feedback on. It's just, you know, yeah. once it gets to a certain level of quality with your editing team, right? But getting that feedback on this story, this chapter, what have you. And then of course the cover, which probably gets the most votes from all of your beta readers, as we call them throughout the journey. Well, that is fantastic. So Matt, let's jump into the book here a little bit, right? You've got all these lessons in here about innovation and mindfulness and and how, you know, slowing down can make you go faster, right? What is that all about? And driving, you know, this whole idea of purpose. Yeah. How did you come together with this idea? You know, what's the, what's the book about? So the book come, is really all about that intersection of mindfulness and innovation. And the reason why I went this route with it was because spending time in innovation, I learned a lot of the things that I shouldn't be doing or ways that I could do it better. And I realized a lot of things like uh, mantras that we have within innovation, you may have heard of them, like innovate or die, fail fast, disrupt or be disrupted. They propel us at speeds that are just on, you're unable to actually produce anything at those speeds, right? So if you really want to innovate and you need to make a decision right away, you're making really bad decisions. You're, you're not able to really think it all the way through. But if you were actually to slow down and think about what's actually happening in this moment? Why did this actually happen? Or, you know, what does my consumer really think? And we start to actually question things and be more aware of our surroundings and our observations. We're able to actually move a lot faster because we don't have to do so many iterations on, on it. And we're also be able, to be able to be a lot more purposeful too. So really what it comes down to is this book takes a very heavy lean towards the innovation side of things. Like what do you need to do in an innovation process? But it also includes in there, how do you do it with a level of awareness? Having awareness as you drive innovation and coming up with, ironically, t taking a bit of a longer time to get through it, but having a better outcome on the back end is is what I'm hearing. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You want to you want to build a better foundation before you start to build that tower, right? I mean, if you if you build a, a, a sloppy foundation, it's just going to fall and you have to start over again. So you'll get there a lot faster by just taking your time and really making sure that you have it right. The first so time. think so thinking about that, so who's the audience for this book and and you know who are you targeting with this this message? Well, if I want to put a blanket statement on it first, it's for anyone who wants to create change in this world. You could definitely glean insights from this process to help you create change. If I had to go a level deeper, it's definitely for a corporate innovators, for people that are just trying to create change within their company, their nonprofit, their home. It, it really is a process of how do you create meaningful, sustainable change? That is fantastic. But Matt, let's pretend I'm a mid to senior level leader at an organization trying to drive change. But at the same time, I've got these goals I have to hit every month, every quarter. So how the heck can I slow down to get that done? What would you say to that person? That is a very good question and a, very, a huge challenge. You have to find a way to balance the two out, right? We do need to hit, we need to hit our goals. That's absolutely a key. So no one's going to let us off. The board's going to be definitely going to be there at the end of the quarter looking for, for that, that result. 
But what can you do to create incremental innovation and also think about, you know, your disruptive innovation and start to think about those things within channels, right? So, yeah, we're going to dedicate 80% of our time to hitting our goals. But then there's also going to be that 20% of time that we need to focus in on innovation because we need to create tomorrow, right? You have, have to think about both. So it's just how do you, how do you find that balance between the two? allocating, I love this idea of allocating a certain amount of your time each week, each month to driving this change, because right at the end of the day, you still have to manage your day-to-day business. And this isn't about changing everything you do is what I'm hearing. It's about finding that that incremental change that you can push on throughout the year. That's Absolutely, awesome. Yeah. So this idea, this, this, you know, books aren't easy to write, right? It takes a lot of time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears that some might say, you know, it takes a big mission, a big why to get this book done. Matt, what was your mission? What drove you to get this done? Like I mentioned in the intro, when I was younger, I always was fascinated with the people that created change, like Martin Luther King, JFK, Mother Teresa. Like, why were they so different than the other 8 billion people that are in the world? Like, how, how did they do it? And I wasn't much of like a, a academic type of person. Like when I went to school, I got, you know, CBs and, and just kind of moved on. But I love to read and I love to learn more about these people. So I really went to books for my education to to understand like what made them such great leaders and you know i also read like you know a bunch of like books in my young adulthood like the uh, seven habits of highly effective people and you know how to influence friends and win people just to really educate myself with within that area and as i got this innovation gig like you mentioned like where you know kind of just fell into my lap there and i was like all right how do i now how do i innovate so I started reading every single innovation book that was out there. You know, the uh, so the innovator's dilemma is one that really comes to mind. But just all these different books on innovation. But I realized that there was this gap within the information that I was reading in these books, and the actual tactical piece of doing the innovation was there was that kind of gap there. And what I realized was that I was reading all this content and taking all this information in, but it was all conflicting information. It was like oh, some might be good here, some might be good there, and it was hard to really decipher what I should be doing. So it made my decision making within innovation to a point where it was like I was innovating just for the sake of innovating rather than innovating purposefully. And I felt like that was a huge gap. And but what I realized is when I started to figure out like the purpose behind my innovation, it reminded me a lot of those leaders that I used to learn about when I was younger. And a lot of the, th- the lessons I learned from them is how I applied this to this book here, right? And it really comes down to innovation is leadership. It is creating change. It's being a great change agent. So I felt like that was missing from the innovation field is right that book that really talked about how to become that change agent because it was mostly focused in on like more process than anything. Yeah, uh, process is so, so important, right? Because if we just innovating for the sake of innovation, that can get us nowhere fast. As my good friend, Jose Perez likes to say, right? Sometimes people invest in technology to drive innovation. And his, I love his line. He says, innovation, can, excuse me, technology can make stupid happen at the speed of light, which I always enjoy hearing him <laughs> say. But when you think about your approach to innovation, it, it sounds like there's a differentiation story here. What do you think the key elements of, of that differentiation are with your book and what's out there in the market? The differentiation comes down to bringing awareness to the situation. I think we always are looking at that process. Like we should be using a stage gate. We should be using six thinking, six thinking hats or six sigma. But really the answers are all within us. And if we just bring a level of awareness to the situation and understand what we need to look out for. So how do you, how do you saw, how do you actually find a real problem? How do you actually become creative to create change? How do you get others to accept it? If we think of those like three variables, and those are the three key variables, like How do you mindfully approach each one of those and bring a level of awareness to each? And I think that's really what this does is it turns the the industry kind of on its side to where it's like, no, let's look at this at a point of, you know, internally, how do I approach each of these pieces of it? Interesting. So, you you know, what what's what's your favorite story from the book or when you like to illustrate about driving change? Because at the end of the day, you have to make change happen as a leader. It's part of the business. It's part of innovation. Well, making change is is tough within with an industry, within a company. And a lot of times, like you mentioned, like innovation, like you bring tech to, to the table and say, hey, here we go. Let's go innovate. Well, like, it, wh- why? <laughs> why? Why should I innovate? And I find that you need a seatbelt moment to start to create change within an organization or within your life. And it's this moment that I had personally that I realized applied professionally. So I went to an amusement park with my family a while back. I was 360 po- pounds at the time. And we wanted to go on every single ride, especially my son. And we saw this new roller coaster that was there. And we uh, saw so it was a long wait, but it was definitely worth it because it was a new one. My son wanted to go on it. So we waited online. And as I walked to the line, my wife's like, sure, you want to do that? You are you should ask somebody if you fit on the ride. You're pretty, you know, you, I don't think you're going to be able to fit into the ride. 
And I was like, honey, this is a new ride. They make these rides for big people just like me. And besides, I got my weight under control. It's not a big deal. We waited on the line and we got all the way up to the top and and I've got my son into the ride, put the harness on him, snug, got him in there nice and snug. I go and sit into it and also I'm yanking on the harness and it's it's not fitting. And I'm like, like oh. <laughs> this, uh, I'm not fitting into this roller coaster. So the uh, employee that was there, the attendant, he uh, comes on over and he's like, I'll, I'll help you out. And he starts to push on it a bit, gets me up, sits me back down the seat, just to readjust and try it again. And then as, as soon as like everyone else starts getting locked into this ride, we're still trying some more employees come over. Next thing you know, I got three high school kids jumping on my stomach like a trampoline to get me into this thing. I couldn't fit. It was, they said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but you can't get on the ride. It, it doesn't fit you. You're going to have to get off. And what really stunk about that moment was that the exit platform was like on another platform. So I had to walk off the line, like take this walk of shame down the line the same way I came in. And it was so embarrassing. The sting was really bad. I felt horrible for my son. He couldn't go on the ride. And because I couldn't fit. And I felt like everybody on that line, even the first person all the way at the end knew what was happening. Like, oh, this, this fat guy couldn't get on the ride. It was horrible. When I got to the front of the line, I noticed that there was like that seat there, like that, uh, that one you could take a picture in. So I did that. I had my wife take a picture of me in that seat just because I wanted to memorialize that moment and not forget it. That was the day that I knew that I needed to change. I needed to do something about this. When you want to create change, you really need to have the four attributes of seat, S E A and T. We have to stop thinking that there, there isn't a problem, right? We have to stop and actually be aware of the situation that we're in. Then we have to have some type of emotional connection to it. Like I had that moment, I was really embarrassed and disappointed. You then have to acknowledge that you need to do something about it. And lastly, you have to tell others that you're going to do it. And those are the four things that I did in that moment. You know, I really just stopped, stopped making excuses and saying that I wasn't really that big. I could fit into a ride that embarrassment piece of it, acknowledging that I needed to do something about it to my wife and, and telling her that I was going to do something about it. And when I did those four things, that's when I was able to create change. And I realized that within business as well, those same exact attributes come up time and time again, when you want to guide a leader to change. Unbelievable. What a, a stinging and painful experience to have this change come about in your life. But you know, sometimes we you know, we have to hit those low points to really see what we need to do to go forward. And Absolutely. no doubt there's many leaders that have had this in innovation where they try to drive change. It doesn't happen. They're not, they feel like they're, you know, getting nowhere fast and spending all this time and energy on it. But sometimes we have to hit that low point to really figure out a way to get forward, which in your case was, you know, let's take a step back, see what's going on here, scan the bigger perspective of what's happening and maybe think about it a little bit. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things you talk about in the book is meditation. Do you have to be a good meditator for this book to work for you? Absolutely not. I mean, you do not need to be a meditator. It is definitely one of the ways to get there. But what it all comes down to is that you need to bring a level of awareness. And that can come through naturally, which I, I doubt, but maybe it can. <laughs> or maybe it's through working out, taking a shower, taking a walk. There's lots of different ways that we can bring awareness into our lives. Meditation is the way that I do it and, and the way that it's very popular in doing it. But you do not need to be a meditator. And if you want to learn it, it absolutely is something that you can learn. Everybody can meditate. I know a lot of people say that it's not for me. I can't do it. You absolutely can. It's uh, You can't mess it up. You know, I've talked to other people who have thought about, have tried meditation because they feel like their mind is always racing and they've tried to stop and meditate and they can't get the racing to turn off. What what would you tell that person? Yeah, it's, it's tough. That happens to me all the time, the, the racing around, especially writing a book, having, you know, working at a job and, and trying to get it all together. Find those two minutes of time that you can really dedicate towards your just, just being, nothing else. Everybody has two minutes. So what I try and do every single morning is I'll sit in my chair in my office here for two minutes, everything quiet, nothing on, and just breathe and just focus in on the breath. And what I'm really trying to do in that in that moment is to just set the intention for the day. Like, you know, really, how do I want my day to be? And at the end of the day, I do another two minutes. And those two minutes I spend in just really reflecting on the day and how did it how did it go? And doing that on the bookends really helps me stay centered and focused and keeps me actually going throughout the whole day. It's amazing how it kind of just turns off that monkey mind that we all have. So that's that's kind of what I do as I, I practice. Wow. And given that there are, I think, 525,600 minutes in a year, we're talking about sort of seven or 800 of them to, to have this meaningful impact on your life. So I love that. Start small. Don't need to you know spend all day doing this. Just a couple of minutes a day, and you can really have an impact on yourself. And yes, it takes. It's not easy all the time to start doing this, but with a little practice, you can get there. 
I love this idea of focusing internally and just on your breathing and just being hyper present, right? It's so, so important. Absolutely. Yeah. You could focus on your breath. You could also do other things too. You could focus in on sound. There's so many different ways you can do it. And like one of the things I do like with food is just, you know, focus in on, on, on every single bite. Right. Cause like a lot of times we're eating and we almost forget that we're shoving food in our mouth. That was my problem. That's why I was 360 pounds. So like, you know, how do you take like a raisin and do a raisin test and just actually enjoy that one raisin? That's a moment of being mindful. So you can even do it while you're snacking. Wow. So let's get back to innovation and what really the outcome of this book is about, right? Tying these two things together. So I'm a leader. Uh, Matt, I've tried to innovate before. It didn't really work. And so I've just kind of left it behind and focused on my month-to-month quarterly goals. You know, where do I even start to try to think about this concept? Yeah. You have to start with a problem. Right. That's definitely where you need to start with innovation. You don't want to innovate for the sake of innovating, but you don't want to start with just any problem. You need to start with the real problem. And I think that's where a good majority of the mistakes happen with innovation is that we're solving the wrong problem sometimes. There's this one story that I talk about in the book from the mid 90s. It was a company called Thirsty Dog. And this owner, Mark Duke, he had this terrible problem. He hated giving his dog tap water. He felt that the minerals and the chlorine that were in the water were really harmful for his beagle. So he decided to make a company that sold water for dogs, bottled water for dogs. He tested it out with so many dogs. It must have been about 10 to 20,000 dogs that he tested out this water with. And it was like a 95% success rate that all dogs absolutely love this water. The flavor was like crispy beef. It was amazing. (laughs) Grocery stores, pet stores all across the country in the US here were super excited about it. They ordered their shipment. They were in 1,700 stores like in their first month of business. But then the second order didn't come in and they couldn't figure out really what was the problem. Like, why are we not selling more water? Well, it come to find out dogs, they don't have wallets, so they can't buy the water. They may love the way it tastes, but they can't buy it. And when you talk to consumers, it wasn't a problem for them. They didn't care about their tap water for dog, right? The, the dogs, they, they were absolutely fine with it. In fact, a lot of people said that, you know what? I let my dog drink from the toilet and they're totally fine. I don't need this. And Mark's response to the owner was like, well, if you wouldn't do it, why would you make your animal do it? So he was arguing with his customers and trying to show them, force them to this problem that that doesn't exist. So what you have to do is make sure that when, when we start to innovate is that we remove our own bias. So yeah, we have to look internally, right? But we have to make sure that our internal guidance is correct. It is, you know, really what consumers are facing and not just something that we think is a problem. Because if we go after what we think is a problem, we're absolutely going to fail. We have to think about the consumer and what they are really seeing, what they're really doing. And when you hear comments like, well, you know what? I'm I'm fine with my dog drinks from the toilet. We have to accept that as the truth and then move and find out, okay, we're, we're really, where is that problem? And for Thirsty Dog, what did he discover the problem was? People just didn't see the the need to to purchase water for dogs because they they were happy with tap water. And if if I had to go down a solution path, which I do talk about in the book here, there's a lot of guilt that consumers have with leaving their dogs home. The the actual direction that the company could have taken was something like going down a, a water fountain path to where perhaps... While they leave their dogs home, they want to make sure they have fresh water, which a water fountain could provide them rather than thinking about a different source of water. So there could have been a completely different path they took if they just talked to consumers and and doing ethnographic research, they would have found their answer fairly quickly. It reminds me of uh, Breeze when that product first came out, you know, they couldn't sell it. And what they ended up doing was actually studying consumers in their home and help people working around their homes every day and helping them understand that spraying this every day made this sort of instead of focusing on what they thought it was, which was like cleaning things up, it was actually making the house smell better and making that a habit. And that Mm -hmm. was when they finally broke free. And of course, Febreze now is, you know, ubiquitous across all these stores. So I love that idea of focusing on the consumer and focusing on the problem, not the solution. Because when we focus on the solution so many times, right, we can, we attach our ego to it and we say, if you don't like my solution, you don't like me. And then it becomes a battle and a force of wheels rather than how do we actually bring somebody to the market that is meaningful and and not be a solution looking for a problem, right? Uh, I appreciate that. So innovation fails a lot. Where does that usually happen, Matt? The biggest issue with innovation is getting people to accept your solution is the answer to that problem. That's like, I think the biggest battle that we face and we face it on two fronts. We face it internally within our companies, right? We have a challenge of getting our bosses to think that, you know what? Yeah, Matt, you have a great idea. This definitely could solve the problem. That sometimes could be the issue. 
Other times it could be consumers accepting it as the the, uh, the answer to their problems. So acceptance is definitely the key. And it's something that we need to think about way before we go to a launch on an innovation. You have to think about that in day one. How do I get people to accept it? And it's usually bring them along on the journey. There was a, a perfumist that worked for, for Febreze. Actually, he was a, a designer perfumist, Chris Laudemule. He worked for Tom Ford. He worked for Tommy Hilfiger and then Febreze, which is really funny. Wow. Um, but when he worked there, he'd go to the office every single day and he'd listen to the opera music. He was a huge fan of opera music. And he always wondered, how can I tell a story through smell? Loves the opera because of the way it tells that story. How do I do that through, through smells? And he designed this device that was a lot like a CD player. And it would play a scent every 15 minutes or so. And it was called uh, Febreze Scent Stories. It was, I think that came out like in the early 2000s. And when this came out, um, the way to get it out there was to start to sell it into other parts of the organization to get them to accept it. So if Chris Lottermy went to the executives and said, hey, look at this machine. It is uh, Scent Stories. What do you think? He would have been met with, that's not a good idea. Why would you think that was somebody would want that? But instead, he approached it a little bit differently. He went to have a conversation with one of the directors and he said, hey, I know that one of our biggest challenges is to trying to create a unique experience for our consumers. That was like their big vision or strategy for the next year. How do, how do we create unique experiences that will surprise and delight them? Well, hmm, have you ever thought about doing something like this? And then there was a whole other team that was working on the nose blindness issue that they talk about in their commercials, right? So everyone goes nose blind after about seven minutes. Your olfactory no longer smells the scent in the room and it's not even there anymore. So how do you how do you defeat that and get people to use Febreze more often? So he hooked his claws into those two key things and developed Febreze scent stories with them to get them to accept it much earlier on. So at the end of the day, you need to get people to accept and even like not great ideas can get through and launch without with acceptance, right? So even though Febreze scent stories made it to the shelves, it wasn't a success. It didn't stay there long, but it just shows you the power of acceptance. And the next key phase for them was really getting the consumers to accept it. So how do they bring them along earlier to get it, them to accept it? So a story I'm hearing here is of getting the internal buy-in first before you take it to the marketplace and then iterating along the way in each case to make it really a meaningful solution. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, it's key is getting internal. Otherwise, I mean, the greatest ideas will die if they're not accepted internally. And not just a solution, but can solve a real problem that people care about out there. Wow. So great stories here around innovation, how you drive change. But speaking of change, Matt, this journey has been a long and, and arduous one for you, no doubt about it. You know, how has this journey changed you, you think? And what have you learned about yourself along the way? My gosh. Yeah, this has definitely been an amazing journey. I think that the one thing I learned in here is that even though it may feel like things are chaotic in my mind, that there really is a process and a reason for the things that I do. So this process has been absolutely amazing because it has given me more structure of understanding exactly why I do the things I do, which makes me a lot more effective of a consultant person. So it's been really cool to just kind of go through that process. So so that definitely has been key to me, key to me during this process. Also, my level of persistence of just not stopping and keep on going, writing for four years and finally getting to this point of, you know, days away from launching a book has been absolutely amazing. And it definitely shows me that I have persistence. And it's something that I, I I'm going to remember on the next challenge that I face is that I am persistent and I can do it. Such a key piece to leading any kind of change. I actually remember the first conversation we had, and I wasn't actually sure kind of, I forget how you reached out to me, but we had a call and I was, I think I was under the assumption that you'd gone through the traditional coaching program, but you showed up actually with kind of this manuscript in hand to some degree. And, and uh, I remember thinking, man, this guy's been on quite a journey to get here. And, and it took four or five years to get it done instead of the, the typical one that happens around here. <laughs> so Good yeah. for you to good for you for sticking with it and getting it all done. And congratulations on that. Thanks, John. So what has been, you know, so many positives along the way you've shared, but what's been one that really surprised you? An unexpected positive you found from from writing the book? I think the unexpected positive for me is that uh, I didn't realize how much a community can really help you through this type of process. And um, I was ready to go it alone and write the book and I totally could have Probably could have did that. I mean, it might not have been as good as it is today, but I could have done it. But having that community around me to get guidance, to get support, and just to be connected absolutely was this unexpected, like positive that I got from, from the writing journey. So it's that's been really awesome. It's, I didn't realize how much I needed that connection, how much I craved it. It's, it's incredible to go through something. It's almost like college or a foxhole buddy, right? You go through this thing, you're all struggling along the same way, you're facing the same challenges, but having it, doing it in that community is just so, so powerful, even though yeah. it's all done over Zoom. 
And it's amazing to me that this program has produced authors on six continents now. You know, I've met people all over right. the world and I've only met a handful of them face to face, which is really kind of funny, not through a digital <laughs> communication tool. Yeah, but so, it's the new in person. Right. The, the mindful <laughs> innovator, Matt, what's the key message? You know, what do you hope readers can take? What do you hope readers take away from your book? Well, the, the message I hope that people can take away from this book is one I wish I had back when I first started innovation. Like you mentioned, John, like the first time I got a call this one Friday morning at like 7 a.m. early at my office desk. I just put my coffee up. I was logging into my computer and the executive suite calls me and says, hey, Matt, we need you to come upstairs real quick. We need to talk to you. You're fired. Right? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That was the feeling I had. I got to the elevator. My palms were sweating. I was riding up, like wondering all the different things that they they needed from me. I was like, this is you know very odd. I sit down in the conference room and say, Matt, we really like what the things that you're doing, the way that you think. We want to start an innovation team and want you to be a part of it. And I was like, holy cow, they want me to be a part of it? Like, what do I know about innovation? I don't have an MBA. I don't have any experience with innovation. Like, you know, why me? But I think I did like most of us would do is like, heck yeah, let's, let's innovate. Let's do this. It was super exciting. I went home that day, told my family about it and started thinking about all the different things I can do. I was like thinking about creating this Disney retail experience, like just really crazy stuff. AI, VR, robots and lasers. What else can I throw in there? It's going to be so cool. I couldn't even sleep that night. And then uh, that like the dream of innovation really started to become you know a real challenge, kind of almost like a nightmare. Like oh my god, like there's there's so much here to really think about. You know all those different books I read, it was really complicating it for me. All those different uh, mantras of innovator die and fail fast made me move really fast. I think if I was going down that elevator today, I wish I had somebody whispering into my ear, just don't complicate the change. Just bring a level of awareness to every conversation, to every observation, to every moment. The answers are in you. That's the message of the book. And that's the one I wish I would have had. Matt, there's so many voices out there. There's always someone who's going to have a different take on it. But if you come up with this focus on the problem, not the solution, right? And have some awareness around it, take some time to really think and reflect on it. You can have some really big impact, both internally and externally for your organization. That is what a great message. The book's coming out here, January 2023, wherever you buy books online. What's next for you and what are some of your goals for the book? Well, my goal is definitely to sell some books and start changing the world. That's that's what I want to do. How I'm going to do it is definitely getting this message out there. And I want to get out there and start speaking to companies, going to corporations, and just spreading the message and helping others create great change in this world. Goal for 2023 is to get on TED Talk. So here we go. The, the TED Talk, you heard it. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's out there in the world. I really wish you the best on getting that done. And no doubt you've got a story that uh, would resonate there. Matt, if people want to learn more about you and your book, where, where can they go? You can reach out to me on LinkedIn and Instagram at Matt Muller Innovation. And of course, at themindfulinnovator.com. That is fantastic. Matt, we did get one praise quote here that I thought I'd really nice for our listeners to hear from Martin Lindstrom, New York Times bestselling author of Small, Small Data and Biology, and shared this really nice thought for your book here. He said, the need to hone our skills around Matt's key principles are imperative for us to correct the frivolous nature of what innovation has become. No matter the industry, no matter your goals, you will glean new insights that will help you walk the mindful path of innovation from this book. Not bad. How did that feel to get that quote from Mr. Lindstrom? Oh, absolutely amazing to have a New York Times bestselling author, sponsor, and, and be able to say something like that. That's absolutely amazing. And uh, I'm still overwhelmed by it overwhelmed, but still focused on meditation, awareness, mindfulness, and driving meaningful change and helping so many others do it. Matt, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story with the creator community. Well, thank you so much, John, for having me. It's been a great time. My pleasure. Matt Muller's book, The Mindful Innovator, will be available this January 2023, wherever you buy books online. Don't forget to subscribe to the Creator Community channel on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. And if you're ready to write your book, visit manuscripts.com to learn how to turn your idea into a published book. I'm your host of the Creator Community, John Saunders. Keep creating. Keep creating.